Well, it's not too sunny around here right now, but I feel like I just want to lift some spirits because this is our final week. And though I feel a little sad about that, I thought I'd brighten it up and make us feel a little bit happy about it. But all joking aside, I really want you to focus now that no matter what I've taught you or what tools you have, to be grateful for where you are right now. That's huge. So there's something called the power of now. And the power of now is that we only have control of what we have right now. Makes sense, right? We can't control what happened in the past. And quite frankly, we can do our best, but we can't control what's going to happen tomorrow. We can only control what's happening right now. And this is huge. So as I talked about with the paradigm shift, I'm not sure if you started to apply that um, in your life, but if you could think of it as a wellness shift, as your paradigm shift, if there was a way to just snap your fingers and right now in this moment, you're just going to start to practice things that make you feel better, you'll actually shift into that power of now phase and make decisions differently in this moment. Not thinking, again, I'll, I'll start this tomorrow or when I'm prepared or any of that that goes through your mind. You can quickly even do the take five, right? You just start to breathe differently. I have this awesome app on my watch and it starts dinging at me and it tells me to breathe. And I stop and I take that breath. And I'm like, I feel different immediately. Literally, immediately. That oxygen goes straight to my brain. I calm down and I think differently. You have to think about our health. And if you think about our health from the perspective of, um, I guess it's your only life source. I mean, I don't know any other way to describe our health, but it's our only life source. But if we can think of our health as a wellness paradigm shift, I am a well person. I'm a well person. Right now, I'm well. I only have control of right now. Even if some of the decisions I've made in the past didn't make me so well. I don't want to be defined by that. I want to be defined by being a well person right now. Okay? Not tomorrow. We don't know what's coming tomorrow. All right? Pretty clear. You are a well person. You are going to act well. You're going to behave well. And you're going to make decisions on being well all the time. Now, sometimes there are things that impact us that for our control or lack of or knowledge could decide on what direction we take, even when it comes to our lifestyle. So when I say that, I mean how we re react to situations. And I'm going to get into that a little bit today. But I, what I want you to understand is that mainly the culprit to what might be happening to you, even if you've used every tool and you're still feeling a little unsure, a little uneasy, it's because we're unable to control the stress in our life, we think. Okay, there is a way to control stress in your life. However, what I want to talk about is what that stress does to you. I have a colleague that taught me this one little exercise. It was so impactful. Basically, she had me hold my hands out to the side, and then she would put pressure on one of my arms. Like, this arm doesn't even need to be out there, but she had me put both my arms out to the side. And so on my arm, she would push down and push down, and of course, I could resist it. So as, the, as she was pushing on my hand, I was resisting her pushing, all right? So I was like, total strength. And then she put some sugar in my hand. And if you think about it, so this is like a tablespoon or two of sugar. And there's 10 to 16 tablespoons of sugar in a can of Coke or pop or any soda. Anyways, I'm just telling you that because it's so much sugar. Can you imagine? So anyways, she put the sugar in my hand. And then she went to push down and like my arm, I couldn't resist it. It was literally flopping. And what it showed me was that when you add something, and we use sugar as the example for the analogy, which was excellent. When that sugar was added to the palm of my hand and my arm fell, I was weaker. So sugar weakens us. But what is sugar in our body when we're stressed? That's what I want to identify and I want to make sure that is really, really, really clear to you. So when we are under stress, our body dumps something uh, similar to sugar, which is glycogen, into our system. And this is some of our 
insulin. So our insulin spikes and dips and falls. So I'm going to explain that just a little bit. So it can not only be important to control things like your wheat in your diet or the specific sugar you're putting into your into your diet or doing your cleanses or watching your portions which i'm hoping your portions are on track right now how are we feeling with those portions really simple eh? like four dice is how much cheese that you need to put on something in your meal or throughout the day let me clarify when i did the four uh cubes i want you to know that that was throughout the day that was your portion for the day, not your portion for every single meal. So maybe one cube per meal if you're thinking of cheese. But anyways, if you have any questions about portions and that's been difficult for you, just let me know and I'll go over it. But anyways, to get back on track. So even if you've changed all of, of these uh, or added these tools, it doesn't matter because if your stress is really, really high, our body is diping glycogen into our system and our body can't regulate that and then it starts to pool or we get excess um, secretion of that and our body can't eliminate it. I'll get a little clearer on that in a second, but stress is huge. Um, so if our body is constantly under stress, I want you to know another thing. We can't absorb nutrients. So even though we're eating nutrient dense foods, our body can't regulate, can't absorb them, can't utilize them because our body is so busy doing other functions like trying to clear our kidneys and our liver in order to um, process that increased insulin, that sugar in our body. Again, sugar being stress, okay? When our body is under stress, it secretes this. Our body actually goes into that fight flight mode and it dumps that and that insulin in our body that we can't regulate or we can't eliminate sits there. And that increases our body fat and or can become a lot more hazardous to our body, which I'll get into in a second. I want you to think about something, though. So when you're in that fight or flight response, so when you're in like the, that win, that battle, our body secreting this can be very, very difficult. So we're running on a high stress lifestyle. Our body is having trouble regulating. I want you to think about kids now. So when they're playing their video games, there's constantly this win, 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 battle to win, to succeed, right? So it doesn't matter if it's a, a um, I don't know, a killing game as that video game or whether or not it's playing bingo as a video game. If you're doing that for extended periods of time, you're putting your body under stress, that fight or flight mode. And when our bodies are in that for an extended period of time, the entire time our insulin is spiking dumping more insulin or our body trying to regulate, which eventually causes our cortisol levels to go up. And I'll talk about cortisol in a second. It's a hormonal uh, gland that's in our body that secretes a cortisol and it's all shot up through the insulin. insulin. So this battle of winning, think of our kids if they're sitting there for three hours, some are playing these games for an extended period of time. It's really, really, really dangerous dangerous for them because it also creates this lifestyle habit, this pattern of this is what they need to do is to be sitting, not active. So the stress of the video game in itself is creating the secretion of insulin. This insulin not being used is, is converts to fat and of course we get weight gain. So not only is it bad enough that they're sitting and they're not active, but they're creating a stress an unnecessary stress in their bodies. And of course, it leads to unnecessary health risks and or damages that can sometimes be irreversible, although lifestyle has a lot to do with it. So I'm not sure if you've heard of adult diabetes. Maybe not. The reason you may not have heard of it before is because there's something called type two diabetes. And that's what adult diabetes actually is. Adult diabetes, diabetes actually became really apparent in children. And when we started to see that happening a lot, not we, but the scientists, um, they had to change the name of it because they couldn't go to a parent and say that their child has adult diabetes because the parent would say, what are you talking about? It's, my, it's a child. They can't have adult diabetes. They're a child. So they've changed the name to type 2 diabetes. 
The sad part of type 2 diabetes is it actually can re be reversed, as I mentioned, and it is due to lifestyle. And it is on the rise. So we know that stress has become one of the number one killers, leading to many different conditions, whether it's a heart condition, which is cardiovascular, or whether or not it's actually something to do with their internal system, which is obviously the regulation of any sugar or insulin in their system. And it leads to many other uh, situations that are happening that can be very, very uh, risky. But it's scary, isn't it? It's quite scary because we know that this is controllable. And some will say, you think it's controllable, but I can't manage my stress. I can't even get my kids to stop playing these games. Well, part of the word I can't is I can. It's just having the right tools in order to be able to do it. So I ask you, in my opinion, to come up with ways to manage your stress. So if you can come up with ways to manage your stress, you'll actually start to self-regulate. Okay, um, much of what I try to teach is self-regulation, but this is self-regulation in a situation that you think you can't control, but you can. I'm just going to share with you some examples that I've done. Um, one of them is when I get bombarded, uh, especially back when I was doing fitness very regularly, running, you know, the three gyms or whatnot, I would announce an email cleanse. I literally would send out an email to my database and say that I would not be replying to emails um, for the, I don't know, I would take an email cleanse maybe two days, 48 hours. I have this little philosophy. I believe that email means I have two days to respond. A text message is usually within a day, but a phone call is emergency, like I need the answer right now. And this is just something that came up, I, I created for myself. So I knew that if I put this out to my friends and colleagues, they would start to adapt to my new lifestyle or in my new um, protocol, let's say, and they would send me emails and not expect responses for a couple days. It worked really, really well, and I actually had a couple colleagues that still talk about it to this day because they've adapted it. I also changed the tagline on my emails to say that I would be responding within 48 hours, and if you need to reach me, you could text me or phone me and you'll get a quicker response. What it gave me is control. So. Remember I said let go of the guilt? I had to stop feeling guilty when I didn't answer people. My mailbox would be full, like I've got like 20 messages that I need to answer, but I've got clients and I've got, you know, my kids to feed and other things, that my, my own workouts to fit in. Being bombarded like that, I mean, technology is great, but we are like bombarded with information at all times and we've got so much more that we have to deal with, whether it's Messenger and WhatsApp and, oh my gosh, the list could go on. Now I could complain about it, or I could decide I'm gonna take, take control of it, and then really not much to complain about because I've taken my control back. So there are other techniques that I've used. So that one worked really, really well for me. Another one that I would suggest is that time is always the issue, our race against the clock. So what I began to do is I started thinking of, if I had an appointment at 9 a.m., I would start thinking of at 8.30. Giving myself that extra half an hour didn't always mean that I gave myself that extra half an hour. I don't know if you ever heard of people um, setting their clocks 10 minutes off just so they always knew in their mind they had that 10 minute buffer. It works, it's great. But what I used that half hour for was if I arrived somewhere early, I would use that time to message people, you know, to keep in contact because I really love connection. Um, I would use the extra time to even meditate. I would use the extra time. I'd even arrive at my kids' uh, functions if I had to pick them up from, let's say, hockey. At 6 o'clock, I'd arrive, say, at 5.30, and I'd bring along my boots, grab them out of my back seat, and I'd go for a half-hour power walk. Or, you know, it's so easy to throw on a meditation on your phone. Anyways, you can come up with lots of things to fill that half hour with, but I created that half hour. So I would take that half hour and I would build it into my time schedule. So planning is everything. Planning is everything for me. And many people will say they don't have enough time. They always say they don't have enough time. But really, we do. It's how we choose to use that time. And if you're having a lot of trouble in this area, time management is probably what I would suggest is your first start. So go back to day one. Forget about all the tools I gave you. Let's work on time management. Time management is huge you basically end up alleviating a whole lot of stress and you end up treating yourself 
to this extra time. So remember I said a way back that a treat shouldn't always be food-based. A treat when you're celebrating something could be a bubble bath. It could be buying that magazine that you don't normally buy yourself. But I see treat as a completely different um, thing than many people might see it. I see treating myself to something, which is time. But I take that time and I make sure that time is available to me. And I know I'm off, really off. I'm much more grumpy. I'm agitated. Um, I feel like I'm not accomplishing my things to do list if I don't give myself the time. And I'm very mindful of it. Think about even like in, in Mexico, they used to take siestas in the afternoon. I know it was because of high heat, but it was giving themselves back, themselves back time. Can you imagine giving yourself back that time? It's awesome. Do it. You'll love it. You'll never want to give it back. I've even told people I'm busy. I don't book appointments on purpose because I've actually got my time slotted in there. They don't need to know that. They don't. You don't need to announce it. However, many people will begin to respect it about you. And maybe if you share this little trick with them, others will start to do it. And maybe then when you're around a lot of people that are giving back to themselves, they're feeling better, you're going to be in a group of people that are all feeling really well. Instead of being with a lot of people that are disgruntled, grumpy, frustrated because they claim they don't have time. They're so busy. So that's not to say I'm not busy. I am busy. I'm very busy. But I'm busy doing the things that I love to do. I try my best to avoid the things I don't love to do. It happens. I, I mean, it sneaks in. But I'm very mindful of my energy. And sometimes when that happens, when something's taken over, whatever it may be, that's out of my control, it's not my norm, I just sit in it. I feel it. I say, okay, I'm not feeling great about this. So I'm going to increase some other things. I might make time to take a walk down to a creek and sit there and do my meditation. Look at the water, breathe in the fresh air. I make time to make that correction. Give back to yourself. It's huge because what does stress do to your body? Well, one, when your body can't handle stress, it shuts down. Number two, your blood sugar rises, so that spike, that spike in sugar that's in your body, it rises and it's dumping into your liver. Your liver begins to store that sugar, that glycogen, and the body then recovers by dumping more of that sugar in to balance it out. And this dumping of glycogen into your blood system, this irregulates your body's way of um making sure that the levels of sugar that in your are in your body are regulated, as I said, but are under control. So when your body feels there's chronic dumping, it then causes your body to store that sugar because it doesn't know when it's going to get more of it. It also doesn't know how to regulate it. And this effect of insulin levels, it therefore becomes a dysregulating factor to your body. But it's lifestyle. It truly is Lifestyle, your body doesn't just secrete it. That would be type two, type one diabetes. That's something we're born with. That's something that we may not be able to control, but this one we can control. So when the body can't determine the stress, this insulin level or the sugar level might lower, looking for more sugar, looking for more insulin to be released into the body. In turn, this excess sugar remains in the body and it converts to body fat. It converts to inflammation and inflammation is where much disease, many diseases happen. Our body becomes acutely sensitive. It's acutely sensitive to the tiniest stress that can happen. So any amount of stress can eventually cause our body to have a chemical reaction and the brain then even responds to the stress factor, factor and you've, been, you've compromised your entire immune system, whether it be your immune system being damaged, cardiovascular in your heart, your digestive system, then your memory actually starts to go. And this can actually even lead to depression. Because let's think about it. Any amount of drugs, this is like a drug to our body, this sugar coming in, this any amount of a drug-induced feeling, that's what people will feel. They'll feel like, 
They'll feel bogged down. They'll feel uh, feelings of this yucky feeling because their sugar levels are all off. They'll even have fluttering. Um, it's like a drug in their body because it's, it's insulin. It's a sugar that we've created. And eventually our, our mind begins to become affected by this. I love this analogy. You know, I've used the car analogy a lot when I've done my talks, but the one thing with this analogy is the fact that unlike a car, when our car starts to get old or it gets worn down, we can just go buy a new car. We can't do that with our body. We don't even have another body hanging up in our closet. Like if we wanted to change our clothes and we want to put on a new body, we can't do that. We can't do that. We can't snap our fingers and get a new body or a new car, right? We, like a new car, we can't get it. But we can fix things a little at a time. I'm not trying to make this hopeless. But understanding that if we start to manage these stresses in our life, we can start to fix these things. We really, really can. Um, unlike a car. A car, we have to go buy a new car. We can only put so many new parts in a car. Eventually, it just rusts out and falls apart and it's dead at the side of the road. Our body isn't like that. Okay, so it's a good and bad. It's a good and bad. I'm going to read something to you. Let me just turn to page 96 in the book. So if you're following along. I want you to understand that fight or flight response and I really want to drive this home to you because it doesn't matter how much work we do as I said on changing things in our diet whether it be our wheat our sugar or adding the cleanse or portions or any of that it really doesn't matter we've got that fight or flight response happening there's a gentleman Walter Bradford Canyons his theory it states that animals react to threats with a general discharge of a sim uh, sim sympathetic <laughs> nervous system. So we have a, a central ner parasynthetic, set, parasynthetic nervous system. I can never say that word without getting tongue tied. And what it is, it's preparing them for that fight or fleeing response. People are no different than animals. In this theory, humans respond with the fight mechanism and it may be demonstrated through anger, being argumentative, Whereas the flight mechanism, that may be that social withdrawal or watching TV or playing video games or substance abuse to be the worst. In a stress response, the hypothalamus sets off the alarm. That's a hypothalamus. So that's in your brain. It sets off an alarm and a combination of those neurotransmitters are released signaling the adrenal glands, which we're going to get into some of our hormonal glands, the adrenal glands to release adrenaline or cortisol. Adrenaline increases the heart rate and it increases your blood pressure and the cortisol increases the blood sugar levels for the body to use as fuel. Cortisol also stimulates those neurotransmitters to speed up tissue repair as well as curbing non-essential functions such as digestive process, growth process, reproductive systems, as well as affecting the parts of the brain responsible for controlling your mood your fear, and your motivation. My gosh, think of those kids playing those video games. Horrible. Because all of that is what is being affected. That fear, right? Their mood, their motivation, like their motivation to win. And all of this is damaging their digestive system, their growth process, their reproductive system. Ah, dangerous. But for us, it's work. Right? Like, so if your work is super, super stressful, or your life in itself is super stressful, and I mean, even if you're home, I find myself home a lot now. So I've got to keep with the schedule. I've got to keep a routine going. If I don't, if I get off track, my stress goes up because I'm never taking care of me, which means that I'm not good for others. And that whole legacy that I talked about, and that legacy uh, for me of, of making sure that I lived a good life which would be to give back to people, which would be giving back to me, giving back to my family, just being the best that you can possibly be for your community, for everyone around you. It doesn't matter who it is or where you are, okay? It's energy, right? It's a vibration. It's a ripple effect. We feel good, others feel good. So with the digestive system shut down, your body is unable, it's completely unable to process foods, increasing chances, uh, chances. I mean, it doesn't always happen, but you could be even releasing too much weight or burning muscle. When stress affects the digestive in this manner, it is even more important to monitor the diet. Back to what I've been teaching. 
just eating smaller portions every two to three hours, increasing your vegetables, um, which is simply simple digestion, eliminating processed foods, eliminating wheat, refined sugars, alcohol. It will all ensure your digestive system continues to function. Slow down the process of eating by placing smaller portions in your mouth and enjoying texture and taste of, of each bite. Make your environment peaceful when eating and enjoy the moment that you are in. It must be said, why bother making the changes to our diet if we don't change our lifestyle habits without addressing stress? It won't matter what is consumed to make our bodies healthy. We will continue to have weight gain, have poor digestion, and low energy levels because we aren't receiving the nutrients from our food. Wow, so that's exactly what I've been talking about. And I wanted to make sure that this was a theory. This isn't something that I just made up. This is a theory that I just wanted to sh share with you. So let's repeat. Stress response chronically activated causes our bodies to secrete stress hormones, adrenal and epipreferin, which are all filtered by the liver. When the liver is bogged down, it cannot perform some of its functions, such as regulating body weight, blood sugar, thyroid, and fat metabolism. The brain also functions on glucose, and when blood sugar levels become low, we need to eat. If we don't, we become grumpy, <laughs> lack energy, and overall don't respond the same as we do when we are full and our bodies are functioning properly. In the end, chronic stress will cause us to have poor health and weight gain. Okay? So stress is huge. Please, there's so many things you can do. Eat in a comfortable, relaxed environment. Try not to allow distractions. Um, not sure if you were raised by blessing your food when you first received your food, you know, saying a prayer. Um, but if you could just stop and take a breath before you eat your food, that is a blessing to your food. It's super important to um, try not to have those distractions and be, eat mindfully. Remember to chew every bite as long as possible. It's kind of like you're turning it into a paste in your mouth. And then if you can just even think of it as really tasting the food, that whole mindfulness of slowing down, it will then avoid emotional eating. And emotional eating comes from stress. So it's a, you know, it's two-sided coin, right? So we want to control stress and then we don't want to emotionally eat. But slowing down might be a great habit. Creating new habits to de-stress, like even going for a walk. Um, or maybe that's your dessert, right? Some people need to eat and then they have a dessert after. Maybe you add in a walk as your dessert, okay? Just changing that habit or behavior. Try not to respond to a stressful situation with an old habit, such as food as a treat. Remembering food is not a treat if it is going to harm you in the end. So we know that, okay? Uh, do not make eating a situational response to your life stresses. You are sabotaging yourself. You give in. If you do that, make deals with yourself like I'm going to wait this out. Or if you're about to reach for something, ask yourself, am I really hungry? Um, ask yourself to wait and see if you're hungry or not. Perhaps drink a glass of water. You may be dehydrated. So many times you're not actually um, hungry. You're dehydrated. We know that. We need to consume a lot of water. And do not associate relaxation with eating. So these are stress management ideas for you. Um, we have to find ways to uh, make our life fun. <laughs> Imagine. Oh my gosh. So kids are great they're masters at it and we were all kids at one time we all made time to have fun mommy I don't want to stop I want to keep playing okay or daddy um, we learned that we wanted to have fun and I believe that a lot of adults have lost the ability to have fun play more I say and be more play more be more the more you play the more you have fun, the more you are to yourself. I make time to have fun daily. I kid you not. It could be the smallest thing. Even sometimes just reading a book is fun for me. It reminds me of being a little girl. I'll just go after dinner sometimes and sit for five minutes and read. It's the smallest, simplest thing you can do. Find ways to have fun. Reduce your stress. Now, there are other things you can do. I'm going to share them with you. Some of my favorites over the, I don't know, lifetime of 
health and wellness. So I've mentioned the four agreements many, many times. I've actually contemplated doing another, I used to do a course on the four agreements and I love it. So there is the fifth agreement now, there's the mastery of love, the, the voice of knowledge. But anyways, these are, uh, this is a book that I read, the four agreements, but these are the four agreements. And I have these right on my fridge and many people have copied this and put them on their fridges. But agreement number one, be impeccable with your word, which I talked to you about already. Not just the words you speak out loud, but the words you tell yourself. That will immediately reduce your stress. Just thinking mindfully of what you're telling yourself. Don't take anything personal. Nothing others do is because of you. What others say and do is a projection of their own reality, their own dream, their own what they think life is all about. When you are immune to the opinions and actions of others, you won't be the victim of needless suffering. That is a huge one. So don't take anything personal. So I spent a great deal of time ingraining these four agreements into my lifestyle. So I had to constantly, every time something happened, I would think, oh, why'd they do that? Taking it personal. It was huge for me. When I started realizing it wasn't personal, it really wasn't against me. It wasn't to hurt me. It was their journey. It was what was happening to them. It made my stress go way down. Okay, unless I've done something wrong. I mean, if you've done something wrong and you don't take that personal in the sense of how you've hurt someone else and it came back to you, that's different. But most of the time, what others are doing, it really has nothing to do with you. Okay, so don't take your personal. Don't make assumptions. Ah, that's huge. Find the courage to ask questions and to express what you really want. Communicate with others as clearly as you can to avoid misunderstandings, sadness, and drama. With just this one agreement, you can completely transform your life. I'm not kidding. So if you're impeccable with your word that you say to others and or to yourself, you're not taking it personal, then it comes down to not making assumptions. So when you need to clarify, use those words. Okay, be clear with your words. I have had to call some of my friends out on certain things when I get uncomfortable or family for that matter. I just asked them, I'm like, you know what? I just want to ask you a question. Did you mean, and quickly they'll say, no, 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 Lee, you don't understand. Anyways, if you don't make assumptions, it really changes things. Okay, it really does. And the last one, always do your best. Your best is going to change from moment to moment. The one thing I can guarantee you is change. Life is always changing. In the next five minutes, I may be doing something completely different. It's constantly changing. But you go back to these agreements and they're sort of the governing of your, of your life, of how I handle what happens in the next five minutes, right? If I go back to impeccable with my word, don't talk nasty to myself, don't take it personally, don't make assumptions, and then I'm gonna do my best that is a big thing to control, the change from moment to moment. It will be different when you are healthy as opposed to sick. I would make different decisions if tomorrow I found out I would, was diagnosed with something, some terminal illness that I can't control. Touch wood, okay? Cancel, cancel. Um, I always say cancel when I don't want to put something out into the universe. Law of attraction that will bring it back to me, okay? Under any circumstance, do your best and you will avoid self-judgment, self-abuse, and regret. A lot of what people live with is regret. I want you to forget that, okay? Forget it from today on. Remember that wellness shift, that wellness paradigm shift. You are a well person, thinking with a well mind, controlling your stresses the best that you possibly can. Do your best, okay? Another is to use aromatherapy. This is a beautiful candle I have right now, just sitting here as I've been teaching. I've been smelling this rose, beautiful rose scent, and it really changes everything, okay? So you can make what's called a scent tent. So you just take that scent, and you take a breath, one breath, two breaths, doesn't matter, but if you've got a wonderful scent around you, that can really change the stress, having a bubble bath with a nice aroma. We know how that might feel whether it's um, eucalyptus or lavender, right? Um, journaling is big. This is one of my favorites. I have about five, three or four, maybe five. That's maybe my fifth year. It doesn't matter. Years of this, what's called the five-minute journal. And in my five-minute journal, I'm writing each day three things at the beginning of the day, three things at the end of the day that I am 
pretty much sort of grateful for, but I've had so much things like little affirmations that I've seen that really stuck with me and um and I'll read right in there. It's it is like a it is like a journal but slash diary. Um I was raised, you know, diary, hide your diaries, but you know what? To me, some people don't want to write down anything. And I think their fear is that if something was to happen, um, people would read their words. What I would hope that is that somebody who read these, if there was something that came out that I needed to get out on paper, they would know that I was trying to live a life that was pure and I, and I didn't mean in any harm by it. It was me trying to grow and, and, and shift and make decisions. But anyways, um, oh my gosh, one of my daily affirmations, the secret to life is to keep breathing. The secret to life is to keep breathing. And I wrote it again, the secret to life is to keep breathing. So when things get you really frustrated, you know, just take a really deep breath. Just keep breathing, you'll feel better. Um, there are things like angel cards. I've pulled cards, ask my guides. I get a lot of messages there when I'm, when I'm struggling with something or when I'm celebrating something, I'm looking for a message. Um, using many of my favorite scents uh, to light in a space where I, I will light these, I will light a candle, I will pull cards, I will journal, and um, and I will really go inward. I have a safe place upstairs and I've made that my sacred space and that's where I go to. Recently I've been introduced to an amazing, beautiful, beautiful um, ceremony slash tool. Uh, I do a lot of smudging. Um, I've really enjoyed this process. I've actually implemented it every single day into my life. And it's really starting my day off with gratitude, loads and loads and loads of gratitude. I'm doing water, um, I'm lighting the fire, which is, is lighting the smudge itself, uh, there, and grounding with earth. Like There's so many things that you can do. I could go on and on and go through all of my tools, um, but basically all of these tools help me in a preventative way. So instead of those that turn to medicines once they get ill or get sick, these are my preventative tools trying to keep my mind as well as possible. And that is controlling my, my stress, right? My mind is controlling my stress. When I feel good, I behave good, I act good. It's for the better good. And for me, it's love and kindness all around. Honestly, even sharing this message is just love and kindness because I'm hoping that by putting that out there, that's what I'm going to receive. It doesn't mean bad things haven't happened to me. They have happened to me, but I see it as bad things happening for me. I've learned, I've learned to trust that, trust, like trust that everything is about love, right? We only react with fear and love. And if I fear all the bad that's coming to me or going to happen, then I'm operating in a fear-based position, whereas I'm operating from love. Doesn't mean bad things don't happen. Like I said, they do. I identify them, I look them right in the eyes, and like, don't take them personal, don't make assumptions, be impeccable with my word, and do my best. Sometimes I just have to accept that, okay? And that, I hope you understand, reduces stress. And these are tools that work for me, and everybody I talk to, my colleagues, have different tools. So come up with the tools that work for you. What makes you feel good? What gives you back control? Because it's lack of control that causes stress in our life. That stress will sometimes cause us to do that emotional eating, right? Or whatever it is that tries to make you feel better. Have I ever mentioned that the word stressed spelt backwards is desserts? <laughs> Isn't that funny? Because some people, when they're stressed, eat desserts or a sugary or treat type of food. It might even be fast food, which, which is full of sugar. And then that actually puts more um, inflammation into their body, whether it be body fat or inflammation, causing them to be sick. So it's just a full circle, right? Stressed adds, you know, you go eat desserts, and that dessert causes you more stress on your body because of what you've done to the insides of your body. And now that stress manifests into the outside of your body, causing you to have all kinds of other troubles or problems. Okay. So I feel like, I feel like at this point, it's like we're, we're breaking up when it's over, when we come to the end of this program. 
But what I want you to do is love yourself. Like if I send you off with any other message, it's to love yourself. I mean, love, love, love yourself. And that comes right down to my last teaching. Everybody has different body types or body shapes, whatever you want to call it. There's ectomorphs, there's endomorphs, and there's mesomorphs. And the reason I'm mentioning this is that it may not matter, <laughs> again, how much you work the tools or how much you change the stress in your life. If you are managing your life based on what you perceive, I just had this conversation this morning. I, I'm not shocked this is coming up. Nothing is a coincidence. It's noticing the coincidences. I hope you can realize that. So when things are starting to come up for you, things are happening. They're, again, not coincidences. It's noticing them. So I, I, I am so, I, I still giggle when it happens because this morning, so I've been back to doing some crazy training, you know, with some ropes and pull-ups and things I haven't done in a long time. And I never use the scale because I'm looking at, oh my God, this is what I weigh. I use the scale because I'm looking at the percentage of body fat and muscle because I actually go the next step and I take a measurement with a tool that tells me how much is muscle and how much is fat, regardless of what the scale number is. So let's say the scale number is 125. I only need that number because then it, I have to put it into my calculation. So I was doing my measurement this morning and I came in after and I was telling Sean, my husband, I said, oh my gosh, I am so grateful that I have led um, my clients, whoever I've worked with, to always like even take their scale and throw it out. Or I've, I've babysat scales before. I'm like, bring me your scale. I'll keep it because I don't want you to go on the scale. It is not a measurement of your success. And I'm so glad I've said that because I got on the scale this morning. It was up by like five pounds. And th that may alarm me. Okay. That may me, might even discourage me. The average client would get so discouraged. I'm like, don't worry. It's probably muscle. And then we do the measurement. And it was. So I was up five pounds of muscle and I was down like seven pounds of, of body fat, which is awesome. That's great. But I would have got super discouraged this morning had I have got on that scale and gone up by five pounds. So the scale is not your friend, okay? Make sure you go to someone who can do this measurement for you if you're going to use the scale. But the next thing I said to my husband was, ah, but it can sometimes really weigh on you even when you're going up in weight. Because I, my next tool would be a mirror. So I would go to a mirror because, you know, immediately he said, oh, I just look at a mirror and I see, you know, if, if my bicep's gotten any bigger, yada, yada. I'm like, yeah, but we have been raised and conditioned. I don't know if it's just females or, or males because I've had males report this to me that I'll look in the media and I see people and I say, oh my gosh, I wish I could be like her or look like her or even looking at my old self. Like if I go back 10 years and I'll see pictures of myself and I'm like, oh my gosh, look how, you know, maybe thin I was, whatever it is I'm telling myself, it's all messages in my mind. Very, very dangerous stuff, very dangerous area to go into. And this was a conversation I had just this morning and I had to quickly snap myself back and go, wait a second, but you're healthy. You're healthy, Lee. And doing the mirror work, you know, I just said, if I leave you with anything, I want you to love yourself, right? So that mirror work, looking back in that mirror, mirror work was always so hard for me, but looking in a mirror and like looking at myself and saying, I love you, Leanne. I love you, Leanne. Oh, huge. Like even right now, if you could um, just start repeating that, that's a really moving affirmation. And if you get as far as doing it in the mirror, I did a whole course 12 weeks on mirror work. It was incredible. But anyways, where I'm going with all of this is you could be an ectomorph. And so if you look at yourself as an ectomorph, and I'm going to try to cover this up. Let's see if I can do a good job of this. An ectomorph might be someone who's like Gwyneth Paltrow. Okay. So I am personally not an ectomorph. That's not my body shape. It says that a characteristic of an ectomorph is naturally skinny, born with super fast metabolism, eat whenever, whatever, and never gain fat. If misses meals, they'll lose lean muscle quickly. I need to explain that in a second. And this thin linear physique, small muscles, narrow shoulders, hips and waist, low body fat percentage may be considered lucky. The downfall. 
and this is back to the muscle. They lack shape because it's due to low muscle gain. We need muscle. Muscle is power. Muscle is strength for an ectomorph. Morph. If you are an ectomorph, it will be very difficult for you to put on muscle. And let me tell you, it can sometimes catch up with you in years to come. Because when you can't build muscle, you don't have that muscle there to burn the body fat. So when you're unable, maybe eventually to eat, you know, whatever you want and it catches up with you, it'll make you it'll make it that much more difficult for you to change your body shape to release body fat per se. Um, some famous people that have this uh, is Gwyneth Paltrow, Kate Moss, Michelle Pfeiffer, Whitney Houston, blah, blah, blah. okay, you might have seen a ballerina. They are ectomorphs. Their exercise should be heavy weight training because they need to build that muscle mass a minimum of three days per week. And they want to be going at about an 80 to 90, 90% training zone. So that's, let me explain that. So on a, if I said to my client, on a scale of one to 10, say they were working out, whether it be with weights or running or doing cardio, I would say, you need to be at an eight or nine. I mean, you're almost at complete fatigue. Some people call it failure, like they're at that fit, failure point. I don't love the word failure, it's negative. I call fatigue. So you're at 10 with fatigue, complete fatigue. So at eight or nine, it's really high, 80 to 90% of your training zone. You're not feeling that great. Now their cardio, when it comes to an endurance cardio, so that long endurance, so say you want to do a 30 minute run, they need to be around a 60 or 70. They should never feel like they are gassed. And for them, distance running is a great solution to managing their weight, okay? So if that's what they're working towards. The next, I'm going to explain is called an endomorph. Now, here is an endomorph, and let me just see if I've got a name. Uh, Roseanne Barr, John Goodman, um, Jennifer Lopez. No, not Jennifer Lopez. I read the wrong one. Anyways, an endomorph is very um, shapely, I'll say. Okay, the characteristics are high. Body fat. So I don't want to. I don't want you to think when I say high body fat that they are fat people. That's not. That I don't love. I do. I am not classifying anybody. I am not. What I'm saying is, for them, they may have more um, swelling to their body. Okay, more swelling, especially around their mid section, so around their their belly. So they're full figured, and their face could even be a little bit more full figured. For them, they may even be naturally big boned. It's not an excuse. It's just that back to that scale, the bone will weigh more on the scale. They are big boned, larger in the trunk or thighs. They have the slowest metabolism of all three body types. Um, it's great for them for gaining lean muscle and for getting stronger. So many people actually, <laughs> so there's a lot more people that have this endomorph um, body type. And I train a lot of them, and usually with them, they're 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 underestimating themselves at all times. So if I say go pick up a weight and I want you to do squats, okay? So they'll pick up 10 pounds and they'll start doing squats, and I'll walk over and I literally take the 10 pounds out of their hands and I put 15 or 20, and they're always shocked. They're always like, oh my gosh, I don't think I can do that. I'm like, I know you can. You're stronger than you think. Again, your mind gives up before your body. But anyways, I don't want them to get hurt. I don't hurt them. But it's because they haven't challenged themselves. They've got to really challenge themselves because they're strong. And when they challenge themselves, that's when they see their best results. Okay? So it's important to understand that because they struggle with the control of this weight. Their slow metabolism gets in the way. So this picks up their metabolism. They have to be careful of their food selection. They have to choose low calorie foods, which we don't really worry too much about when we're eating our greens and we're eating the way I've explained, like an 80-20, like most of your plate would be those vegetables, those greens, and then a little bit of protein, a little bit of complex carbs. And it's great because they, when they, okay, so they have a great deal of losing body weight, but then keeping it off. They have to work really hard all the time. Okay, however, if they fall in love with whatever it is that they love doing, moving their body, they will feel their absolute best because they have that muscle and they have that strength. They've got that power. They just got to keep doing it. 
okay? It's that Nike saying, just do it. Their diet, it has to be high in simple carbohydrates, fruits, plenty of veggies, which is what I'm talking about, and smaller portions more often throughout the day to keep calories down and energy up. Proteins from lean turkey or chicken, fish, and amino supplements, 30% protein, 60% carbs, and 10% fat. All what we've learned here with the answer. Must have cardio and muscle conditioning balanced. Hydration and fiber intake are top priorities. Drinking water helps to transport the flow of nutrients and flush out the waste products. Lowered fat intake all around, up to 10% only. Um, eat more proteins, as I said, flax oils, um, almonds, walnuts, all the stuff we've learned. So not a problem. It's just understanding the body type. The last one, mesomorph. Okay, so mesomorph, and I'm gonna have trouble, so you've already seen the pictures, um, so I'm just gonna try to underline it. Would be like Demi Moore, this might be like a, a Jennifer Lopez or uh, someone in the media portraying it, uh, Sylvester Stallone, Mr. Universe, Madonna, Alicia, anyways. Basically, they are somewhat the luckiest of all three body types because the protocol, a proto, Typical body type is this fitness model and bodybuilder. Other two types have it hard. The mes have it harder because the mesomorph has the best of both of those worlds. They gain muscle um, like the endomorph as well as lose fat like an ectomorph. Their body balance, broad shoulders, narrow waist, larger muscles, naturally fast metabolism due to the amount of lean muscle and low body fat percentage. Anyways. So if you see someone who moves with ease, builds with ease, like they, they just start working out and all of a sudden, bam, they're in shape or they can just go into a, a bikini model contest, no problem, no matter how hard you work, they probably have a mesomorphic body, okay? Um, they just balance their workouts between muscle conditioning and cardio, 75 uh, is their training range. Um, I'm telling you, they pick up a weight, they start getting results that fast just having the motivation to do it for all three of them right just to be highly motivated but the reason I brought all this up is I don't want you to have in your mind a perception of something that is unachievable uh, taking a picture at the beginning of this program I had encouraged um, to be able to look back and just see are you vibrating more is your skin changing at all is your hair glowing a little better like look at those things Look in the mirror, look at yourself and fall in love with what you see right now. Last but not least, we got to get into adrenal fatigue and I'm going to do this really, really quickly. Um, so why is it after changing your diet, exercising and working on your lifestyle cho choices, do you still feel exhausted and not full of energy? Well, it might have to do with your adrenal glands. So what are your adrenal glands? They are two triangular shaped um, Anocrine glands located on the top of your kidneys. They are orange in color and covered in connective tissue. I don't need to go into what they are. Your adrenal glands work together with your pituitary gland and your hypothalamus in the brain to produce a number of different hormones. These hormones are a key component for your health and vitality. Where I'm going with this is we need to balance out our hormones. We need to balance out what could be adrenal fatigue and some will come say that, oh my gosh, I hit that midlife point and all of a sudden nothing works. Well, your adrenals get bogged down, okay? So when we're you know young and as we're aging, our adrenals are working, they're functioning really, really well. Um, we don't need to do anything to maintain that, although starting earlier, you know, in your, your teens is a great time or even as a kid to start to learn some of the tools that I've taught already. But if you haven't done that, um, then your adrenals are becoming fatigued. Symptoms. Morning fatigue. You don't really seem to wake up until 10 a.m. If you've been awake even since 7 a.m. So it's 10 o'clock in the morning and you're like, oh my gosh, I need that second cup of coffee, which we should all be off coffee at this point. But let's just say in your mind, you're like, oh my gosh, it doesn't matter what I've done. I still have that. In the afternoon, noon, you still have those low feelings, the sleep, sleepiness or clouded thinking. That's usually between 2 and 4 o'clock. Or you get this burst of energy at 6 o'clock, you finally feel better from your afternoon lull, and then your sleepiness sets in around 9 or 10. However, you resist going to sleep, 
and the second wind at 11 that lasts about till 1 a.m. when you finally go to sleep starts to kick in. Now, you might not have that all, okay? You might have parts of it where you just see little uh, glimpses of some adrenal fatigue. Well, the cravings for sugar or food or high fat salts might start to kick in, increased PMS or menopausal systems, mild depression, lack of energy, decreased ability to handle stress, muscle weakness, increased allergies, lightheaded when getting up from sitting or laying down, decreased the sex, sex drive or frequent sighing. You're just feeling off. If you have any of these signs or symptoms, you may need to treat your adrenals. Here is a treatment for adrenal fatigue. Take a break. And I mean it. Like, put your head down in the middle of the afternoon, during work even. Okay, I used to do these office meditations. I literally would go into offices and lead them through a 10-minute office meditation. Helps your adrenal glands, okay? It helps. It really, really does. Laughing, exercising, minimizing your stress, taking negative people out of your life. Ooh, that's severe. <laughs> well, I've had to do it. I've had to do a little bit of an analysis. If I find I am surrounded in too much negativity, it sticks. I come home exhausted. I am coming home saying, oh my gosh, that person drained me. Okay, just pay attention to these people. You may not be able to completely remove them. Just be mindful of them and start adding in a little bit more self-care after being around them. Do something fun every day. Combining unrefined carbohydrates. This is one that I, I, I talked about um, last week. So if you're looking at your food combinations and you haven't really identified it yet, something like um, having spaghetti with meat sauce and red sauce. So taking out the meat and just having red sauce with the pasta. So it's the complex carbohydrate with the simple carbohydrate. Could be a little confusing, but that might be something you really want to look at. Go back to your food diary and find out if the food is affecting your adrenal glands. Eating five to six servings of vegetables each day, first thing I've seen people eliminate. So when we leave each other here, the first thing I see people do is decrease their vegetables. Fruits, not so bad, but vegetables. We need vegetables. Taking a calcium or magnesium supplement. I take a magnesium supplement with vitamin C every night. It's just a little tiny capsule. And um, it also allows me to sleep more soundly. So when I have good sleep, I manage my stress better, obviously, the next day, and my adrenal glands are much more supported. Taking 2,000 to 5,000 milligrams of vitamin C each day, adding the sea salt to your diet, which controls the iodine. Remember I talked about the iodine? and uh, that you This is iodine here in case you're wondering what this is. I'll sometimes use that um, topically. Taking a vitamin B complex um, that is high in B6, and um, yeah, look at your diet, consuming the fresh fruits and vegetables, your brown rice, like I've talked about, your ancient grains, your legumes, your nuts, your olive oils, your safflower oils, your seeds, adding maybe wheat germ to your smoothies. Um, there's just so many things like garlic and onion that you can add. I've got so much to teach you, so much to teach you. But if we start looking towards that, if that's where we think the culprit is, at this stage would be a great time to hire somebody, hire a, a holistic person that could come up with, I am not a, uh, I'm not certified in that, I can't write diets for people, but if you ever need that ad additional help, if you think it's adrenal gland fatigue, I would definitely look at hiring someone to write you um, some type of diet. And when I say diet, remember I told you, writing your diet, writing down what you eat, not going on a diet, just writing down what you eat. So, I have so much love for you. Oh my gosh, this has been incredible. All of that I, of what I've taught you, I really believe it is not really um, anything that's not common sense. It, re it really is. It's not stuff you haven't heard before, okay? But it's not always common practice. I've said that before, common sense isn't always common practice. How do we make it common practice? We change our lifestyle and we just start little by little by little, little, because life, life, the big thing of life, it is not a destination. It is a journey. 
I'm always learning. I'm always adapting. I'm always taking in new tools, new information, new teachings. I'm always, always trying to grow. But the underlying to it all is loving yourself, truly loving yourself so that you will take care of yourself. That is the biggest gift you can give to your friends, to your family, to your community, right? Love and light. Love yourself, but don't light to others. So others can love themselves, but light to you. We will change the vibration of everyone around us. It's not always happy. I'm not always glowing. No, no. But 80% of the time, I try my best. 20% of the time, I'll hit a lull. I'll hit a bump. But I look back to what is happening in my life, what's happening in my lifestyle, and I can do a quick change. So I wish you all the best. Make some changes. Identify with what you're looking at, what body type you might be. And if it's a perception, throw it out the window. You are perfect the way you are. Keep growing. Keep learning. And I wish you all the best. Big love. Enjoy. Life is good.